you for the opportunity and we should thank also our Lord Jesus Christ for the opportunity to be together here and to discuss a little bit of, of the gospel. And before I start with the subject, which is chapter 11 of the book of the codification written by Kardec and the I Spirit, the Gospel According to Spiritism, I want to talk a little about what is this, the Gospel. And I will read the passage of the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things come into being. Not one thing coming to being except through him. What I was come to into being in him was life. Life that was the light of man. And light shines in the darkness, and darkness could not overpower it. And here we have a picture from uh, one of my favorite painters, Baroque painters, called El Greco, that portrays the Pentecostals. And all the previous study that was here in this morning was about mediumship. It is, mediumship is not only a task or a journey that we start in ourselves, in our inner world. It's also the journey that when we start that inner journey to perfect ourselves in the communication with also with the spiritual world. So all of this truth comes into being in two, like the contact with the truth comes into being in two halves. The discoverer of ourselves in order to perfect ourselves and the contact with God and the higher spirits. And Pentecosts really symbolize that. So each drop of fire that is above the disciples and the virgin represents one specific tongue, the gift of the tongues. So they start talking in different tongues in order to spread the word of God in Pentecost Day. So we're talking about revelated truth. And this revelated truth came into being in three big waves. This, uh, the talk that um, um, was given last week was more about this. But it's just to clarify what is this thing called the gospel. And when we mention the gospel, it's the word. It's the word that feeds our spirits. It's the word that directs us through God. So the first revelation came in our culture, the Western culture, came through Moses. And Moses establishes the law. So he established the law that mediates our relationship with God, the first tablet. In the second tablet, it established the law that mediates the relations, our social relations with, it, with each other. But then it came to Christ. And Jesus brought us the second revelation that we still didn't, are unable to fit. He brought us mercy and grace because the law was too hard to follow by the letter. And Christ brought us the law of love. This is the second revelation. The third revelation came with the higher spirits, symbolized by the Holy Ghost, and was codified by Kardec. In this revelation, I call it the science of love, which is spiritism. Which it came to the modern man, this notion that religion it's, cannot be detached from reason but it's always about the gospel, and the gospel, the truth, it's only one. So every comment or every passage that we are going to read here comes back to Christ and his message that was written and left by his disciples, in the, at least in the four canonical, called canonical gospels that we have in the New Testament or in our Bible. The third revelation is just the final part, after 19 centuries, after the revelation of the, of, after the second revelation, we get the footnotes, we get a guide. We call it like it's just a present in order to guide us how to understand the second revelation, how to understand the law of love, and that's it's going to be the main topic today. 
The law of love is the greatest command, and this is really well described in Matthew 22, chapter 34 to 40. And it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. But the Pharisees were kind of the men of the clergy at that time. So they were in the temple, basically. It was the tribe that uh, it was the tribe that um, had privilege, and it could be uh, to priesthood, priest, priesthood, good. And they say one of them, an expert in the law, so the law of Moses, tested him with this question. So his purpose was to test, was to see Jesus fail and crumble, because Jesus was gathering a lot of followers at that time, and it was a threat, at least at their minds, to their institution in their religion and it asks and this is a common question in the new testament teacher what is the greatest command in the law jesus replied love the lord your guide with all your heart and with all your souls and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment the second is like it love your neighbor as your as yourself all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments let's just like stop a little bit and think the first commandment is love the lord your god with your all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind this was written in the law of moses and jesus was just reminding them do we do that all the time what is love your God? It's respect the law of God. It's being tuned with Him. It's live like the psalm says, walk with your God humbly. Are we doing that? After 20 centuries? After even 5,000 years after Moses? It's hard. And then the second commandment, because God say, love thy neighbor, so to love your God, it's to, it implies that you will be loving your neighbor, is it? And the question is, do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Do we even love ourselves? That's the question. That's important too. That's an important question, right? This is like, you know, this is Sunday school. We go to Sunday school, you know, any, any faith, any religious faith, and, you know, we hear this over and over again. But we don't think about the depth of just these two small commandments. They're really easy to understand. It's not hard, right? But they're really easy to, they're really difficult to follow. Okay, that was the animation. <laughs> but here is the question. Who is my neighbor? Do I love myself? What is the self? What is this, the self? This is also like a weird question, right? Even psychologists today are trying to get the answer to this. What is the self? Well, I know that I show already this in the last presentation that I gave here, the last talk. Black implies white. This is Ellen Watts. Self implies other. There is no self without the other. It's like a contrast, right? There is no black without white. There is white without black. They need to be. One implies one another. So the neighbor is the other, is something that is not me, something that is a part of me. There is no self because I cannot recognize myself as an individual if there is no other. Or else, if I only exist in the world, I don't have consciousness about me. So I need the other to understand myself. In this way, there is no way to love ourselves without loving the other. So, it's kind of like a snake that bites his own tail. Kind of this riddle. And this is also, although we are individual dots here in the universe, we always live in relationship with others. We are, and it, we are like this, the universe is like this fabric. We are just one fiber of the fabric. But we need and we entangle with the other fibers in order to build this wonderful tapestry.
So just bear in mind the concept of this idea of the other. And if you follow the chapter 11 of the Gospel according to the Spiritism, there is this second part of Matthew, also mentioned in Mark, 22 chapter, uh, chapter 15 to 22. And it tells the history, the story, when the Pharisees also try to tempt and trap Jesus. And they say, they ask, Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And this kind of like, they are like, we know that, you know, we know that you know the law, we respect you, at least. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. This is really important. It doesn't pay attention to what the others are. What is the social condition of the others? Right? So he's, he's willing, Jesus accepts everybody. Tell us then what is your opinion. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? So because Jesus was accepting everybody, and because they cannot find a flaw in the interpretation of the law of Moses in Jesus' teachings, they try to try to trap Jesus with the institutional power. Jesus said, they, Jesus know what is what they were doing with him, and he, he said, "You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax." They brought him a denarius. So a denarius is important because the denarius was the you know it was the currency in that time in the Roman Empire. And Jesus take the denarius like who would take just a, a dollar bill and say, "Whose image is this?" And whose inscription? Caesar's they reply. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. So this here, we're talking like the Jews felt oppressed by the Romans. They were occupying the Rome, the Jerusalem. They were occupying Israel. So we say, Well, you accept everybody. You consider everybody as your neighbor. So the question is, are the Romans our neighbor? Are the oppressors our neighbor? Is that the other, are they also, should I love them as the law of Moses also said to me, love thy neighbor? And Jesus said, yes, and you should comply with the social rule that is instituted. Because it's not the social rule that gives life. It's your actions that give you life. So the others also include our oppressors. In our terms, it also includes our obsessors. They are no different from us. They're probably a little bit misguided, right? Sometimes we, are, we also obsess them. So, they're also children of God, like us. So the general principle here, and this is a comment from Kardec, is respect. This is the first step for love to respect somebody. Sometimes we get confused about love, you know, we need to be all giving and, you know, this misconception idea that was developed in the 19th century, which is closely tied to the romantic love, but true love, the first step is to respect. Respect the rights of each person. And to respect is to respect everybody. And because we are not living as only by ourselves or only in our intimate tribes, but also in society, it's fulfill our obligation towards our family, society, and authority. So, you got it. Especially the social role of this teaching. But what should we do in a more personal level? How should I love the other? Well, the answer is again in the Gospel. Everything is in the Gospel written 2,000 years ago. Everything is there. And there is this thing called the Golden Moral Rule. I just put moral because it's called the Golden Rule. And it's in Luke, chapter 6, 31. Do to others as you would have them do to you. 
so simple, so sublime, and actually so universal. All of the main religions in the world say this. This golden rule, love thy neighbor, it's present in all religions pattern across history and across the world. So let's see what the Baha'i said. Baha'i it's kind of like a syncretic religion that sums up all of the religions. So they consider everybody's prophet on, on that religion. So they say, bless he is he who prefers his brother before himself. Buddhists say, Buddhists say, hurt not others with that which pain yourself. Our brother Muslims, and I reinforce here, our brothers, because are, they are being persecuted right now, at least the ones that are moderated, just by, you know, unfortunately, some sects um, that are more radical, and they are being suffering by that, so, like, partition set of the subset of Islam it's been more radical and the moderate Muslim is suffering directly by that they say none of you is a believer in God of course until he desires for his brother what he desires for himself Christianity all the confessions of Christianity refer to this loop versicle do unto others as you would have them do to, unto you <coughs> Hinduism in the Vedantas and in the Vedas, it is perfectly clear, this is the sum of duty, this is what you have to do here. Do not do others that which you have done to thee would cause you pain. Judaism, the old law, the Torah, and in the Talmud, it is written, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Zoroastrianism. It's a really old religion. It's placed five centuries, ten centuries to five centuries before Christ. And it's founded by was founded in Iran by a prophet called Zoroaster or Zarathustra. And they say that nature only is good when it shall not do unto another whatever is not good for its own self. It's, it's a universal principle and it's a rule that when civilization started this rule it's all they always keep in saying this to us God in his infinite love is always keep reminding this to us and why didn't we follow this rule because it's really hard so can we be more specific? What is this entail? What does this entail? Can somebody read the gospel according to Luke to me? Somebody which is comfortable with reading English? <laughs> but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. So, this is kind of like, it's hard, right, to follow this. Especially if we follow this, this saying of Jesus by the letter, because it says, if someone slaps in your cheek, turn to them the other also. And someone that steals your coat, do not withhold them. What is this saying? What is the most important teaching? What do you think? What is the most important teaching here? What is Jesus talking about? There's two, 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 two really important things here in this teaching. Don't react. You can react. It's natural and human to react. Detachment. It is detachment. But 
No, yes, you sh uh, don't react, it's kind of like implied with the reaction that like you should have a certain reaction to this. Yeah, you should react positively. What is Jesus think you're talking about? Forgiveness. Just let it be, just forgive. If somebody slaps in your face and somebody offends you, forgive. Because you are also a target of divine forgiveness. And always. Right? And then it's a give to everyone who asks you. So the object of our love is everybody. Everybody inside our creation. So we get again to this parallel of the Good Samaritan. Over and over, this really simple story that talks about kindness. But probably, and I was looking at a video from one evangelical preacher yesterday, and I we got some good insights on that. It's probably one of the most misunderstood parables in the New Testament. Can everybody start reading? On one occasion, an expert in law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as, as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to go in down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pulling an oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in, into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Everybody, everybody knows this story, right? Probably everybody read this story, I don't know, like a hundred times per year, right? So, there's a lot of things happening here in this story. The first thing is, again, Jesus is tested by a Pharisee. So the intention of the Pharisee was not good. He's trying to trap Jesus and see if the Jesus theology or Jesus teachings as some flaws according to traditional Judaism. To inherit eternal life, to be really alive, to stand before God and walk with God humbly, this is eternal life, to live. And Jesus, and Jesus, like, and the, the, the doctor of the law got the right answer, because the answer is in the, in the Torah, right? You go to the Old Testament and you find this. Love your God and love your neighbor. And Jesus said to you, you answer correctly. He didn't say, follow me, believe me. And Jesus said, you answer correct me. Do this and you will be fine. You will be okay. And then, you know, the set of like, Jesus didn't try like, believe in me. 
You just say, Jesus, no, no, you, you, you answer correctly, do this. Do this and you will have eternal life. You will walk with God humbly. And you will live your life righteousness. But then he needs to justify yourself. And justify himself is saying that I didn't got it. The Pharisee was he was mad. I didn't got it. He just replied me. I went with the law and we, he re, Jesus replied with the law. I didn't got it. They so say, okay. So who is my neighbor? So let's put these things in the context. Who is my neighbor? Who is my fellow other? Who is the object of my love? And Jesus understanding the struggle of the man tells a story. And this story didn't happen, right? This is just like, it's just a parable. It's kind of a story that has a moral intent. So it talks about one thing at that time, and it's really important to understand at that time. So Jerusalem is really high. Jericho is really low. The road that connects the two, it's really, even today, nowadays, we're seeing that, it's really a steep road, even today, like uh, bus riders have some difficulties to get to Jer Jericho, and as it's a, sw it's a swinging road, right? It has a lot of curves, back and forth. It's a perfect place for robbers uh, to be at. And it's kind of like, has a lot of rocks, and people can, it has a lot of hidden places, so people can go there. So it's a dangerous road. So there was a man that was got robbed because it's, it was a dangerous road, got there. And then Jesus talks. While he's talking, he says, a priest was going in the same road. And the person, the doctor of the law, probably like, what Jesus was doing was giving the most act of love to that person. That person was attacking him. He was an enemy to Jesus, right? He didn't want the good of Jesus. But Jesus said that this is the right time for me to show him how sick he is, how absent of eternal life he is, right? Because he has all of these misconceptions and all of these judgments inside his head. And he said, okay, so a priest comes along the road and the, if you were a doctor of the law in that time, we'll say, okay, the priest will, you know, help this poor man. But the priest did not. Right? The priests go to the other side. And it's a perfectly natural thing to do. You are in the just road. You see a man half dead. Right? You don't want to help that. You are scared to help that. So probably if you go help him, probably you can just be charged by murdering the poor man. Or also, probably you will get robbed also and beat it up also. So you are afraid. So you just went up your road and go to the temple to serve in the temple. A Levite, so it's from the tribe of Levi, uh, in old Israel, it was not the tribe of the priests of Israel, but it was a tribe that helped in the religious office. Right? So we were all, like in the temple, organizing stuff. So he was pretty, a Levite was pretty, you know, he knows the law. So he's pretty acquainted with the law. He saw the same man and he didn't love his God because he didn't follow its command. Love thy neighbor. Right? He was scared also. So he passed away. But then it came a Samaritan. Samaritan were the Jews, the Hebrews, of Samaria. And this, it's kind of like history. For now, the Samaritans were totally outcast from traditional Judaism. They could not go to the temple. They were the, un the filthy ones. Why? There's, like, because at the time when the kingdom of Israel separated in two, the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Judah, where is Jerusalem right now, the Sam S uh, Samaritans were the ones that, you know, get married with non-Jews, you know, we kind of was there, they were considered like a lesser race, like um, um, they were not well seen, they were the, in the lowest bottom of the social hierarchy, and this, they were unfit to go to the temple, just to see how a Samaritan was considered in that time <coughs> by the traditional Judaism. And the Samaritan is the only one 
that loves his God. Because it's the only one that does the right thing. And just and it does it so abundantly with such a lavish. It's just abundance that it says it probably goes and goes to the man, kneels, he needs to, you know, patch the man, so probably just tears a piece of <coughs> Purifies or try to you know, create a, an antiseptic with wine and olive because wine and olive was what they used in that time and it's especially by a traveler to prepare his meals so that's the best thing that you can do to, to cure the wounds brought the man to an inn stay with him all night right the next day, he took out, said Jesus. So he stayed with him all night, willing to that poor man. And then it gave two denarius. Well, you know, what is two denarius? Actually, I saw this yesterday. How much is two denarius? Right? So, there's a tablet that was found in a Roman, you know, in a city under the Romans, uh, in the, uh, under the Roman Empire, not, not, not um, very far away. And um, a night in those types of lodges would cost one over 32 denarius. So this man gives two denarius. It's an all day work. It's the salary for an all day work. And two denarius will pay this poor man that was robbed two months in that lodge. He paid more or less two months. And he, was, he didn't even say it to the lodger. Take care of him, spend money on him, I want to be this man to be fine, right? And when I come back, if you spend more than this, I will repay you. Who does this? You can do it once in a while, right? But who does this? This is the question. Who is able to do, to do it? constantly there is one at least one being in the universe that does this constantly take care of us constantly with unlimited love any any suggestions god god christ right But God created us uh, him as his image, right? So probably we are able to do this. So this redirects me to the good, you know, to what, is, what is to be a good spiritist? It's not being, it's try to fulfill the good Samaritan. It's making an effort, going towards that direction. Because it's almost impossible to do. Doing this is lived by the law. It's almost impossible. But at least recognize that we are always forgiven by our Lord, by our God. Every time that we do something wrong, every time that we do something against our nature and against the nature of the universe, every time that we move against the law, we are forgiven. I know that we believe in the law of cause and effects, and we believe in karma, right? And what we do right now will, you know, we will get, we'll, we will contract debt, and we need to pay that debt. But how much of our debt is being paid? How much? By the grace and the love of our God. So, how many, how, many, how many times do we behave as the unmerciful, unmerciful servant? We are always being forgiven every day by our Lord. Always. How many times did we not forgive the other? Right? It's not a question of like letting everything pass. It's not a question about like um, not, you shouldn't take this to the ladder, right? It's, it's really the question that 
sometimes we just hold grudges against people for nothing, like for small things. How many times did we didn't forgive? And we are always being forgiven. So it's written also in the gospel, say, by the measure that you measure the others, you should be, you should, you shall be measured. It's not God that will punish us, it's our consciousness. It's ourselves. Because we, inside, it is written in us, like our DNA. It's kind of like a spiritual DNA. We know what is right to do. And sometimes we don't do it because we are proud, because we are selfish. Proudness and selfishness are the root of all evil. So sum it up, Kardec and the Gospel according to Spiritism say, do to unto others as you would have them do unto you. Express the most complete form of charity. This is true charity. It's not doing social work. This is, that's also important. It's not giving money to the poor, the alms, like we are going to see in the instruction of the Spirit. It's this, it's following the golden rule. It's forgive. It's to support, to help others like the Good Samaritan did. That's true charity. Because it summarized all of man's obligation towards his fellow men, and I would say towards God. Right? What right have we to demand that they behave in any better manner? that they be more benevolent or more devoted to us than we are to them. It's really interesting when we read this question, that Kardec, this rhetorical question that Kardec says, and go back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. The question that was posed to Jesus, who is my neighbor? But Jesus ends the parable saying, who was the neighbor? Jesus wasn't saying, you should ask the object of your love. You should be concerned is giving your love to be the neighbor, to be the other, to place yourself in the place of the other. And say, Kardec continues, the practice of these maxims leads to the destruction of selfishness, when then have been adopted as a rule of conduct and as the base of all institutions, then man will understand true fraternity and so make it possible for peace and justice to reign on this planet. There will be no more hate nor dissensions, but only union, concordance, and mutual benevolence. So it summarizes of our obligation. So we are here, of course we have our specific missions, but we are here to follow the golden rule. That's it. Simple as that. There is no mysticism here. And it's towards everybody, our family, our society, authority, just as much as for individuals in general. The practice of this maxim leads to the destruction of selfishness. Selfishness, question 913 of the Book of the Spirits, which among the vices may be regarded as the root of the others? Selfishness, as we have repeatedly told you, from it is from selfishness that everything evil proceeds. So, if we reap from our art selfishness, we fulfill our mission, regardless what are we, what we should do here. And then, then man will understand true fraternity, so it make it possible for peace and justice to reign on this planet. So, if we want to see this planet evolve from a proof planet to a regeneration planet, we need to start to apply the golden we need to start to rip off selfishness from our hearts. And it's hard, because it's really embedded in us, right? But every time that we have a selfish thought, let's like tune and say what Jesus would do in this position. Jesus was here, and it will, st it will still guide us, but Jesus was here not for us to pray all the time for us. It was either like, see, this is the way that you should do it. He was giving a really nice last class. This is the way that you should behave. That's why he say, I am the way. Follow me and you will live eternal life. You will walk humbly with your Lord God ever. 
So, going to the end, sorry about this, probably more 10 minutes, and we have the instructions from the spirits. So, even in the Gospel, the Emmanuel talk, everybody, anybody can read? Oh, really? Really? Thanks. <laughs> Selfishness, the plague of all humanity, is hindering moral progress and must disappear from the earth. It is the target at which we should point our arms. This will be greatly needed by each individual if they are to triumph over themselves, rather than triumph over others. Therefore, let each one of us use all their strength to combat their own selfishness. It is a denial of charity and consequently the greatest obstacle to human happiness. Do to the antagonism between charity and selfishness. Christianity has still not completely discharged all of its mission. It is to you on whom rests the responsibility and the duty of eradicating this evil so as to give Christianity its full force. Expel selfishness from the earth and from your hearts so it may ascend the scale of the worlds. Thank you. Selfishness. It is the denial of charity. It is our biggest enemy. Right? If it was a being, it probably would be Satan. Right? Because the Satan, like, if you go to the Hebrew word, word it means adversary, enemy. So selfish, it's our enemy. It's our greatest obstacle. And according to Paul, selfishness is the essence of love. And sometimes we think we love somebody, but we are being selfish. We are trying to trap that person, right? We are clinging to that feeling because that person makes us feel good. That's the opposite of love. Because according to Paul, charity was love put in motion. And basically, charity and love we're twin sisters. So if you go to read Corinthians 1 that um, Claudio so well read at the beginning, if you go to read early translations, the word love is replaced by charity. So it is kind of like, the translator is kind of like, it's the same thing. The Greek word that is Paul is mentioning is the same thing. Now, this is our task right now. It is up to you who rest the responsibility and the duty of eradicating this evil so as to give Christianity its full force. It's not being that I'm a spiritist. It's not coming to the center every day. Right? It's putting into practice this every day. Christianity, Christ didn't come here to found a religion. Christ came here to show us the way to live. It's not being trapped in really complicated theology and the hierarchy of the spirits or the angels. Just do this and you'll be fine. Pascal, some of our engineers in the room will notice, also came and said, can you read it Claudio? Yeah. If mankind love one another mutually, then charity would be better practiced. Severity and rigidity kill all good sentiments. Christ never avoided anyone, nor he repelled those who came in in search of him, whoever they might be. When will you take him as your motto for your, all your actions? If charity reigned on earth, then evil could not prevail. It will fade away in shame. Begin by giving examples yourselves. Be charitable to all, without distinction, and make an effort not to heed those who look on you with disdain. Live the task of doing justice to God. Christ never repelled those who came in such a way. We as spiritists need to be, this we need to be really engraved in our minds. Never judge others. Never. And we are going to see about judgment after, from the message from Elizabeth of France. 
but you should never just like despite their appearance despite the path that they took in life right despite their religions despite their beliefs Muslims atheists all of them are object of our love because we are no different from them if we help them we are helping ourselves because what we are this fabric we are just single fibers of this really gorgeous tapestry being made by the beginning of time. So here, I'm just going to wrap up with Elizabeth of France and saying, and she really reinforced this, the love toward our rebel brothers and sisters, and she's really directing to the criminals. And she said, Criminals should be loved as God creatures, which they are. Every criminal, every brother that transgresses the law, being in jail or not, our neighbor that does the wrong thing, he is also object of our love. And they say, she said, sublime charity, as taught by Jesus, always consists in the constant use of benevolence in all things pertaining to our neighbor. Be benevolent to your neighbor. Sometimes we need to be strict because sometimes we need to, you know, guide him to a specific direction, but always with a kind heart. Always be benevolent to him. And then she talks about that, uh, you know, in this message she talks about the alms. And alms is something that is really rooted in Catholic uh, thing that you go to search and you put some money in the alms box, right? And say, that's okay, that's fine, you're helping somebody, but that's not true charity. And she says, a few words of consolation, encouragement, and love would raise, would raise them up, those alms, the our brothers that are in the other side of life, up to the Lord. Love one another then as sons and daughters of the same Father, never despise any living creatures. creatures. They are our neighbors just as much as the best of mankind. We are all in this together. Their souls, our obsessors, were created as our own to be perfected. Help them then to get out of the quagmire and pray for them. Wrapping up. So, main takeaways for today. Simply love by respecting, refrain judgment. Giving, listening, offering, and forgiving. And you might surprise yourself because what goes around comes around. Law of attraction. And don't forget, and I'm going to leave you with this. Keep calm and follow the golden rule. <laughs> Thank you so much.